not a time to laugh because <laughs> because what I'm going to speak about. Can I, your presentation? Can I, I don't want to speak here. I just want to give this. Okay. And, and I don't have a PowerPoint. And what I'm going to speak about is, is not a laughing matter, because I'm struggling to make a sense out of it. And frankly, even though I'm very thankful for having the privilege to speak, I'm kind of having a fatigue. So please bear with me. And uh, if you are hungry, blame it on your hunger. The, the idea here is that having worked in the open air project, and having been initiated um, to a lot of uh, interdisciplinary interactions with my colleagues, and we talk about open access, open innovation, and all those stuff. And this is really something I want to be able to ask for your help to struggle to frame it. Because uh, we know that intellectual property rights has been on steroids. And that is the reason most of us have been able to galvanize. And in fact, if there is anything we like about the TRIPS agreement, it's because it's a wake-up call to Africa and the rest of the South, uh, global South. And so that becomes a major issue for us, even though we are grateful to the TRIPS agreement. So one of the challenges, and we have seen the results, when there is intellectual property overreach, what do we do about it? And so all this talk about access to knowledge, open innovation, open access, copy left, copy center, and then copyright, creative commons, GPL, and all whatever. So all of this, as we begin to talk about them, what are they supposed to be doing? We all know what they are doing. I think it was two years ago that Peter Jazzy was talking about the power of framing. And it's important, when I keep working in this area and looking at them carefully, one of my challenges is that we are ad hocly responding to ever changing and increasingly complex technologies. And therefore, as a lawyer and an academic, it's always a struggle for me to begin to have some sense of theoretical grounding to some of these concepts. And working in the open, open air project. One of the struggles I personally kept um, dealing with was open access, collaborative knowledge, production, democratic participation, and all that stuff. That is really the way to be able to help them the intellectual property overreach. But then the question becomes, what actually is the problem. And my problem is this. And I've begun to see little nuanced literature emerging in the last five or six years about how there is a counter narrative to the open access, open innovation movement. And we are approaching a situation where the counterfeit is looking closely like the original. And we're not likely to make any distinction at intellectual level. There is a lot of nuances emerging from this. And I'll tell you just two stories. And this is so familiar. Everybody probably coming from North America in our field would have an idea of what I'm going to talk about. Probably. This, there is a little city, a suburb of Ottawa called Canada. That is Ottawa's mini Silicon Valley. And the bubble stopped after the dot-com bust. Now, littered around Canada would be some graveyards of little startup digital, you know, privately owned companies. Now, there was a big elephant that fell down around the same periphery in Canada. The name is Nortel. It's a very huge high-tech company in Canada. So it fell down, just like, forgive me, 
if you kill an elephant, what happens? People will gather to see how they can take their own portion of it. And something happened. All the intellectual property assets of um, Nortel were auctioned off. And it was for $4.5 million. Guess what? A combination of Ericsson, Apple, Microsoft, they came together and formed a consortium called Rockstar. And now, what does Rockstar do? Rockstar calls itself an intellectual property licensing corporation. Some of us here call them patent trolls. And they are not in the business of knowledge production. They are in the business of knowledge marketing. Now, but then when you use the framework of collaboration, shared engagement, democratic participation, horizontal, vertical licensing, open access, and all that stuff. When you use that analogy, you see a counter argument being made. Oh yeah, that is what we do. Can Apple and Microsoft come together over dinner to have a conversation? And they are doing that. They are collaborating. They, are pro they kind of pretend that they are producing knowledge. And all the stuff that we have tried to do to distance ourselves from intellectual property overreach. That framework, when you directly plot it into this place, you then have a problem. But then the idea here is, but you said they are in the business of knowledge marketing and not knowledge production. Why would there be a problem? And this is really the problem with framing, particularly when we jump and run with concepts that are not rigorously theoretically, uh, theoretically interrogated. And so, the question and the problem I'm having and struggling with as a researcher is we, and this is not our fault as academics, as people working in this area. Um, one day, just like as I was listening to Sonil, I just began to have some concepts. There is a lot of framing that are becoming counterproductive to simplifying things. I'll tell you another story. And this is the one that hits me a little close to home. There is a first generation Canadian immigrant of uh, Algerian origin. His mother is a very old woman in her 70s. This gentleman goes home every other year or two. And this time he came back home and said to his son, he was telling a story, grandma went about distributing seeds to her neighbors. And the, the story went like this. There was a time there was a very big drought in, middle, in, in, in the mid-20s in Algeria. And this woman noticed that a particular section of her farm, there were some drought-resistant crops that did well. The next year, she noticed that again. And eventually, she kept those seeds. She went about sharing it to her neighbors and telling them, this is going to prevail. For some reason, I don't know. And the neighbors welcomed it and took it in. Now, when this story was told to this little boy, he said to the daddy, why did grandma do that? And the daddy said, why not? And he said, I guess she could have made a lot of money out of that. The daddy said, I thought as much. And I asked her, why not? And the boy said, what did she say? The father said, she said, we are a community and not a competition. Yes, this is exactly the point we have been trying to make. And uh, Susan made that point again today. How can we, and Ruth made that point yet again, how can we be talking about intellectual property using, and let me say again, Nagla made that point again. How can we be talking about intellectual property using predetermined frameworks that are not completely consistent with the local realities? And how have we gotten into this 
crisis of using concepts that are not rigorous, rigorously theoretically interrogated so that we know the limit to which we can deploy them and preempt a counter narrative that completely makes a mess of some of our responses. And I'm not blaming me, neither am I blaming you. I'm just thinking that technology, innovation, and everything that's been happening in the innovative space in the last 20 years have made us as intellectuals and academics to run with whatever concepts that appears, even sometimes on Times Magazine. And, in, and we run with it. And we own it. We like the phrase. We move with it. We run with them. But then we play into the hands of those whom we want to court. The whole mission here is this. Essentially, we want to look at intellectual property. We want to know whether this property analysis or analogy even applies. Well, Ruth talked about contract today. But how can we, even in attempt to catch up with the technology, lay the foundation that will really carry the weight of our theoretical engagement to a sustainable level? This is my ranting. Thank you.